Brittany Waters has served on the Charleston County School Board for the past two years. Now she's seeking re-election. I talk one-on-one -on -one with her about the issues within her district and what she wants to do if re-elected for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Courtney Waters, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, Quentin. How are you? Doing great, actually. I know that you are currently a Charleston County School Board member representing the North area. But now after redistricting, you actually have North Charleston and parts of downtown Charleston where I live. But let me ask you this. Obviously, you're also running for re-election. Tell me, why Courtney Waters? Why re-election again? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So it, it's really just that, you know, this term would have been four years. It's been uh, condensed to two just gotcha. because of changing the law. Um, and what I realized is, you know, these terms are set up uh, in particular ways to be, you know, for, to give people the chance to be the most effective. Um, it, it has taken, you know, the bulk of two years to really just learn and get acquainted with um the very specific issues in our system and uh, understand what the levers of change are. Um, and having sat in that seat for two years, uh, I, I feel like I'm able to, to capitalize and make an impact on another two years in a big way. Um, we've got some major initiatives that are coming up that we really need uh, hearts and minds for children at the helm of. The most significant is obviously choosing the next superintendent. Uh, another one is making sure that we stay committed to these student outcomes focused mm -hmm. goals. Um, it's really important that we get laser focused and uh, structured and aligned in the way that we're assessing performance in our district, because what we've seen year over year is that we're doing things and we're doing things and we show up for the same results year over year. Uh, and so we've got to put a very concerted, a very a strong concerted effort toward changing things for our students. And you don't get to do that um, by changing over so much at once. We're going to have a completely new board, only two of us uh, still in the race for re-election. Uh, and I take that very seriously. The onus is going to be on us to um, educate a new board, to usher in culture for the board. We've had terrible culture in, among our school board uh, for since forever. Uh, and as a person who leads an organization, culture is incredibly important to me. This doesn't have to be um, you know, a toxic environment. It can actually be a collaborative environment uh, that is focused and that is effective. I want to talk to you about all of that in just a second, but you also said this on your fly, which I got to my house, actually. <laughs> it says oh, wow. this, Courtney Waters, mom, parent, educational professional. What is an educational professional? Yeah, so um, I'm serving right now as the interim executive director for Teach for America, South Carolina. Uh, so, of course, I'm a former teacher. And right now I'm working in, on the nonprofit side, placing teachers in classrooms across South Carolina. We predominantly place teachers in rural areas. We don't actually place currently in Charleston County uh, because our work really lives in areas where um, it's hardest to fill seats. And that happens to be areas like Florence, like Colleton, like Darlington. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we are, Orangeburg. Yes. Um, but I, so I'm very close to what's happening in education across the state. Uh, I'm very close to what's happening in education at the policy making levels. Uh, it is something I'm deeply concerned about. Um, it, it, being involved in an organization that receives funding from the state, I understand uh, what it means to be a government organization, which I'm not a part of a government organization, but a state funded organization. Uh, but Charleston County School District is a government organization. And so uh, there are rules of play. But then also inside of those rules of play, where are the moments and opportunities for innovation? Uh, and as an education professional, as that says, uh, I'm coming to the table able to to have something to say about that. So how much funding are you getting for Teach for America, particularly this year, 2022? Um, well, I, I'm not sure what that has to do with Charleston County, but I mean, we have a budget of about $2.8 million uh, in total. That comes from a number of sources. Sources. So what, mm -hmm. are, what are those are the sources usually? Uh, the state uh, districts pay uh, a, a supplement to get teachers, and um, we also get private funds, just some, uh, a lot of foundation funds uh, from organizations like Sisters of Charity, oh, like yeah. the Davos Foundation, like the Henry and Sylvia Yeshik Foundation. Yes. Uh, so a number of things. We we raise money just like other nonprofits. Now, you also said in this campaign slogan that you put students first. So is putting students first a policy position? I don't know. I mean, I think everything is a policy position when you sit on a board. Um, it is going into policy conversations and thinking about the impact uh, to students and not just thinking about uh, the numbers or the data points, but the real people who may or may not be impacted by decisions that we make. 
So let me you talk about that. Let me talk to you about District 4. What are the top three schools right now in your district? I mean, those would, would so in my new district, I'm not entirely sure because the makeup has changed. Um, it used to be obviously academic magnet, right. SOA, uh, right. schools that really most of our kids don't actually go to. Um, so right now I know that, you know, having the lower half, the lower right. part under Park Circle, I've got Sanders Clyde, Mary yes. Ford, Shakora, yeah. Morningside, um, and, and so in and, and Deer Park and in schools like that. And so there most of them are actually some of our lowest performing schools. So when you say the top schools, it, 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 it varies, you know, depending on if we're looking at uh, measures of reading, math. Um, you know, all of that kind of stuff factors in. So I'm not sure which are the top, but what I do know uh, is that almost all the schools in the D4 uh, makeup really need the most attention and the most resourcing. Well, I'm a proud graduate of Santa Clyde in 1995, so I want to let okay. you know that. Okay. Let, me, let me go to this. What is the reading and math specific proficiency that is right now at Santa Clyde? Um, so Sanders class specifically, I don't know. What I do know is that only 23% um, of black children across the district are reading at grade level. Uh, I know that the figures are similar around 21% um, to some odd for uh, math. Um, and so when you talk about school to schools, you know, specific, when we look at data, we look at sort of aggregate and we look at sort of trends. Uh, and so I don't know school specific, but I do know um, that we're trending on the bottom and so if you think if you realize if you look at it and you say the average is 23 percent that means we could be lower than 23 percent we could be hovering around 23 percent but what can you understand what were the average years of experience for teachers at their park for instance yeah um so i don't know the average at that specific school again but i do know that schools like deer park schools like uh, morningside tend to have teachers leaving uh, after two to three years so in schools where it's uh, hard to retain can you hear me okay in schools where it's hard to retain teachers uh we've got to take a look at the environment and the culture in the school and how we're building that to be supportive of both the community values uh and the student needs uh, the other thing is when you're in school um environments where students are are behind because they didn't get what they needed in the beginning those teachers have to have a higher level of competence um, and so intensive training needs to go there, um, along with that cultural, su cultural support and strong leaders need to be there to coach those teachers up to accelerate progress. So what are the community needs and what are the students needs right now? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, Charleston is changing. It's a changing demographic. And, and what we have is a, a tremendous need for wraparound services in some areas where they're just not going. Um, what we have is a, a disparity of need in, in, in areas. I think about um, the area where I live, where North Charleston, where Morningside, where the School of the Arts and all of that art. It's a completely changed community. Uh, downtown is no different. Um, and we're, we're a lot of times talking to the folks who have just come here versus the people who have been here. Uh, for a long time, uh, who have been under resourced for a long time. And so the needs vary. Maybe um, certain programs need to be in their schools. Maybe they need more resources because they, there are no booster clubs to raise money to put veterinary science programs in their schools. Um, which one of our schools in this district has. And so where you have some schools that don't even have uh, Algebra 1 offered, uh, you have veterinary science in other schools just because they're able to raise money. And so I think it's a matter of resource. I think it's a matter of looking at the entire ecosystem and saying, you know, where is there um, support needed for the parents um, to, to achieve higher education, to achieve more skilled jobs, um, to be educated in how to advocate for their children. So that's sort of like what the community needs and then what the, what the students need are just really strong teachers that are going to understand that they need to uh, craft a plan, a learning plan that's going to accelerate learning while also holding high expectations and not treating the children like they're, they're always going to be behind. Because when you get out in the world, nobody cares that you started out at a deficit. They only care about what you're bringing. And so those teachers need to be equipping students for the world they're going to meet um, at all times. So what is the learning loss right now in your district, District 4? Yeah. Um, so, so we've suffered uh, some of the most. I mean, when the pandemic happened, uh, it, it was a, an interesting learning for me because I did not expect this to be the case. But when schools went virtual, it was actually a lot of students in my community who uh, didn't go to school and went to the virtual level because maybe they had multi-generational living and didn't want to bring COVID home to their grandparents. Um, or, you know, just, just a number of reasons, just fear of re-entering the school. And so we had a lot of virtual learning uh, scenarios um, and virtual learning wasn't successful for all students. And so um, we saw some of the greatest backslide 
um, backslide in schools like the ones that I represent. Um, and so again, they're the schools where the need for acceleration, not just, um, you know, sort of the traditional learning plan is required. So what is the graduation rate at North Charleston High School? Uh, so I know that there's an, there's been a lot of, um, increase in it recently. I think it's, um, either high 60% or, uh, in the 70% range. Um, so it's been increasing, it's been improving. Um, I can't say that I specifically know what measures led to that. Um, but North Charleston is also not in my district anymore, uh, as you may know. So let me ask you this. I know it's not your district anymore, anymore that is, but what percentage of students at North Charleston score the C or higher? on the algebra, biology, or English gateway course assessments for the end of course, say, 2017-2018 semester. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't know that, Quentin. Again, uh, that's not really the level that the board operates at. We see data uh, in aggregate. I'm looking at the, I'm, these questions are coming from the strategic plan now. Yeah, sh well, sure, but what I'm saying is, uh, that strategic plan is brand new and it's not specific to North Charleston. It's specific to the entire school district. So I wouldn't know 2017 would happen at North Charleston. Um, but what I know is the trend over time and what we need to do to reverse it uh, and get it going in a positive direction. What is the achievement gap in your district between minority students and non-minority students? Well, I mean, I, I mentioned before, you know, if, if we look at reading, we've got 23% of black students reading on grade level, 77% of white students reading on grade level. So, uh, you know, that gap between 77 and 23 um, is significant. So how much does the Charleston County School District actually spend on paying for standardized tests? I mean, I, I don't know how much they cost, but, you know, standardized testing is, is required uh, by law. Um, and whether it comes with complications or not is, is certainly, you know, up, up for debate. And I certainly don't think we should be um, thinking about students as only their numbers. Uh, but if you're going to be able to change something, you need to be able to see where we're starting um, in order to figure out how to get to where we're going. How much does the Charleston County School District actually spend per pupil? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that right off the top of my head. Um, what I do know is that it's more, uh, it's higher than um it's one of the highest in the state. Um, that doesn't mean that it's enough, but um, but it is, you know, I think it hovers around $12,000 per student. And speaking of which, I know that you, you, you're you making on this campaign flyer here that says that Morningside Middle School gets needed renovation money. So let me ask you this. I've, obviously, you led the charge to fund the rebuilding of Morningside Middle School in North Charleston. How did that en enrollment increase, student enrollment, enrollment increase after that? Well, I, so it, I, I don't, it, it probably didn't. So, that building campaign is just starting. So in the next school year, students from Morningside will be shifted over um, to the old Garrett Academy, Garrett right. um, campus so right. that, so yeah, so that the, the building can, the rebuilding program can begin. And so there, there wouldn't be like an immediate impact to enrollment because nothing has actually happened yet. Let me turn to the Charleston County School Board. I know that reportedly the board is proposing to basically delegate the majority of its policy decisions to the superintendent. What best, best practices can come out of all of this, Courtney? So one, let me clarify that the board is not delegating its policy uh, decisions to the superintendent in any way. Um, the board is responsible for creating policy. The superintendent is responsible for implementing policy. Now, what comes along with that um, is a series of administrative rules and um, a series of actions that have to be taken in order for the superintendent to do that. So what the superintendent owns is that administrative rule manual. Um, and also, there are policies that just statewide, for instance, are an HR function. Well, the board doesn't engage in HR policy, right? So that's going to be stuff that the superintendent has to supervise their chief HR officer to do. Um, and so want to make the very clear distinction that board policy is, and as required by law, will continue to be the responsibility of the board. But anything that has to do with day-to-day -day operations that is not board policy will be the responsibility of the superintendent. So I know that the items being turned over to the superintendent are essentially items that still need the board's approval. So how do you all make this make sense? Yeah, I mean, the board approves the policy the superintendent implements and the board holds the superintendent accountable uh, for properly implementing that policy according to the law and according to the desires of the board. Now, the board, I, I know that the board has not uh, basically started a new superintendent search, but it's still ready to dictate exactly how the new board will conduct the search. So... Let me ask you this, Courtney. Should that search be left to the new school board? Well, this, we're not making any decisions on um, the superintendent search, but let me be very clear. Um, we're in a very urgent situation where we've got a new board coming and there is very little that has been done to put us on a path toward ensuring that we're going to have a new superintendent um, by the end of the year. 
Um, and I think that that was done by design. Um, it is not, you know, we keep getting into this, who should do this, the new board or the old board. There's a current sitting board that has responsibility today. And as much as we could have done to get down the path um, of, of getting the new board ready to select a superintendent, we should have done, but we did not. And so moving forward, all of the work, in fact, all of it will be done by the new board. Um, and so there's, there's really no question about who should do it because the reality is the new board will do it. So should you all keep Donald Kennedy as permanent superintendent? We need to conduct a national search and look for an experienced, proven leader. Um, is he proven in the experience? In finance. And being a superintendent? No. Okay. So let me ask you this. I know that obviously you haven't reportedly been involved in changes to the power structure to Charleston County School District. How does this affect the achievement gap in District 4? The, I think that's exactly the problem. We have no idea. The, the changes are happening when there's no strategic plan in place to say that these changes needed to happen at all. Um, and so what I can say is nobody can tell you definitively that anything that's happening now is going to impact achievement because there is no plan that's been voted upon with actions following it. There were actions while a plan was developing, which is inappropriate. Let me ask you this. Why is a lame duck school board empowering an interim superintendent to shake up the organizational chart and personnel to this extent? You would have to ask the board members who voted for that because if you look at my voting record, I didn't vote for that. Speaking of which, let me go to Jarita Postaway. She left the district a few months ago but stayed on as a consultant until she was hired, obviously, in Lexington 1. So if she was good enough for Lexington 1, then why did you all give her $500,000 to just walk away? So to be clear, when someone leaves a job, they have a contract that requires that they be paid out the remainder of their contract. So we didn't give her anything. She actually received what was due to her. Um, but also, if you look at the data um, over the time that she was here, it remained unchanged. And in some ways, it back, it slid backward. And so uh, while I have no issues at all with Dr. Postawait and, and learned a lot, she just wasn't the leader that this district needed. Um, and I think we, we need to do everything we can to find the leader that this district needs. Did she go along with the reimagined proposal? I don't think go along with. I mean, it was just a proposal that was introduced. Um, it, it came before the board. Uh, there was a reaction and then nothing else happened. So I, I wouldn't try to say she was going along with anything. Well, let me ask you this. How is the district strengthening its school improvement councils? Obviously, when you think about the reimagined proposal. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, again, that's something that's beneath the purview of the board. I would hope that they're doing everything they can to start leaning into school improvement councils, given that we've started this community engagement process that we're going to be having uh, each semester. We're going to need groups of people who are uh, knowledgeable, who have come together and understand um, the complexities of the district and are able to give feedback. And so I know that, um, you know, school improvement councils are required by law. I know that they are doing what they uh, are supposed to do as required by law. Whether we can say they're the most effective they can be or the most robust, I don't know. And what the plan would be, I wouldn't know because that's just not something that would come to the board. So when you think about this reimagined proposal, what will be the school, uh, class size as far as that? Well, reimagine didn't pass. And of so, course. yeah, so it, I, think, I, I don't just, know. Yeah, I'm just talk, yeah. thinking, you know, hypothetically. Yeah, well, it would have been decided. So that was the thing about reimagine. It would have been decided um, by those individual schools. Uh, what was going to happen was that schools, communities would get together with the convening organization uh, and district officials and make a plan for what needed to happen in their schools. And then they would go away and figure out all the inputs that would be needed to get to where they wanted to go. And so class size is, is super specific and I wouldn't be sure. Let me ask you this, Ms. Courtney. Why would you, a board member with less than two years of experience, be so interested in changing and reducing the school board's governing power? So um, I think that, one, I don't think it, there's no change or re reducing of the school board's governing power. There's a focus on what a school board by law is actually required to be doing. Um, but in my two years, you know, you can look at it as just two years or you can look at it as two years. And I've had two years of experience seeing exactly what's happened and being able to assess in the seat why we haven't been successful. And before those two years, uh, I've had experience as an educator. I've had an experience as someone who is working in education nonprofit, who works across districts, who thinks about education from a state and national level to understand we have not moved and been able to interrogate the reasons why. And so what I know is that school boards are one of the largest and even a Clemson study 
um, you know, several years back, identified that the way that our school board operates is actually the number one, like the number one issue in this district is that this school board cannot get on the same page, get focused and get clear about what we can expect from students, what we can expect from staff, what we can expect from anyone in this system. Um, and so organizing the board under a governance structure is the most urgent need that I can see coming out of my two years and all the years previous working in education for the last decade. Let me go back to uh, Dr. Postaway because you all created a consultant position for Postaway after she left. So let me ask you this. When you think of Dr. Erica Taylor, why did you all create a consultant position for her? Well, as you know, I actually voted to right. bring Erica back. So right. uh, it's purely because this administration didn't want to. When did you get the information that she didn't want, that they didn't want her there? Uh, the day it happened. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you said, uh, uh, from what I heard from a lot of people, that you were not going to run for the school board again. But now here you are as an incumbent. What changed? Um, a lot of things changed. You know, this work is very personal to me. Um, students in this district are, are, are having experiences not unlike mine, uh, not unlike those of my, my four younger siblings. Um, and I feel a need to be on the board speaking up for what children who look like me and had experiences like mine uh, are going through and how our actions are dictating outcomes for their future. Um, when I think about the fact that this entire board is going to be brand new and that there are probably people looking to capitalize off of the, the fact there may be a little dysfunction in getting a new board organized. Um, I think it's very important for someone who uh, to be there who has incredible passion for the kids and nothing else. Um, I'll be honest, this, this being on a board, the reason I was thinking of, about not running again is because it's very, um, it's very unclear to me. Um, not very unclear. What I'll say is it's the school board has the potential to make a lot of change and a, and a lot of impact to students and it has a lot of potential to do nothing. And this board has really done not much. Um, and when I say this board, I mean, mine and boards past. I mean, we've done some things, right? We've got some pieces of the puzzle, but like a large incremental and a I mean, not incremental, but a large, um, integrated in, um, structure change movement has never happened on the school board. Um, and so I thought about not returning because of the dysfunctional, uh, nature of the board, because of just how often the school board is a hindrance to progress. But then I thought, why, why walk away when I know this and I can actually be in a position to do something about it? Did you file for re-election, Ms. Courtney? You were endorsed by the Coalition for Kids. When did you accept that endorsement? Now, now you know, dates, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago. Oh. <laughs> maybe a month or so. I think, I mean, whenever it was called, we did the, the, um, we did the questionnaire, I think, to be due sometime in September. And so that, that would be when I accepted it. So how, let me ask you, how did you go about coordinating with the Coalition for Kids to put whatever it is on your flyer? Yeah, well, they asked me what, actually, it was funny because I didn't, I didn't know what that would look like and what would be on it, but they just, in the questionnaire, asked what were the three accomplishments I was most proud of. And I mentioned Morningside Middle School, and, and then it just sort of showed up on the flyers. Well, let me ask you this. When did you know they were going to actually pay for your advertisement of these flyers? Um, I guess, I mean, I guess I always knew because they, they did things last time. I mean, that's sort of what they do. That's what all the organizations um, that endorse do. They'll send some kind of mail out or they'll do, you know, something like that. I know, Dan I know Dustin Daniels, the director of the group, says this quote, they passed the eye test, they passed the credential test, they passed the passion test, meaning the people that they've endorsed, including yourself. But do you, Courtney, pass the integrity test? Oh, I absolutely do. Well, what about... Let me ask you this, because Dan Daniels went on to say this, that they believe the candidates represent a renewed energy and passion for quality education. So where was this energy and passion before the Coalition for Kids? I think the passion has always been there. I mean, that's just, that's something that he said. I mean, I, I, I think people are passionate. I think there's a difference, though, between being passionate and actually being uh, knowledgeable, as well as with a balance of being willing to learn um, and a willing to work in pursuit of goals for other people and not yourself. Um, people talk, people say all the time that, you know, folks get in positions of power and then very little happens for other people because it, it, you know, you sort of get in these seats and it's like, well, this would work very well for these people over here. That would work very well for those people over there. But like, can you go to the table, um, 
and really like resist the temptation to get involved in things that won't make a difference for kids and just keep the focus where it needs to be. And I think I've demonstrated that I'm willing to do that. But how can you empower great teachers and principals within the Charleston County School District and ensure great, excellent public schools when this group who endorsed your coalition of kids is reportedly and allegedly trying to privatize Charleston area public schools? Yeah, so I, one, I don't, that's been said quite a bit, but I'll tell you my perspective. Um, when it comes to what makeup a school should have, whether it's a uh, traditional public, public, private, charter, magnet, I am agnostic, meaning it does not matter to me what the structure is because all structures have harmed children who look like me, who have experiences like mine. What is important is who are the people in that building, who are the people who are running these operations, um, and what is motivating them, Right. Are they motivated to just make a difference for kids or are they motivated for selfish reasons? And that's the question. Um, so, you know, I can empower principals. I can empower students uh, by putting resources where they need to be, by giving them the autonomy that they need to have, um, irrespective of, of whatever agendas other people operate with. I only have uh, an agenda to make things better for children. Uh, and I want that to be led by in input from the community, from their families, from the people who support them. So I read this article from the Post Story that basically says the Coalition for Kids is poised to spend roughly $309,000 quarterly on obviously getting you all elected. So if that's the case, it, it, do you all feel like you have already lost? No, I think I would win regardless of having the coalition. I, oh. I thought that the first time. Oh, how can you? Well, I, have the I have the qualifications. I have the drive. Um. And I think that when people um, really, really meet me and, and understand why I come to this work and what I come with, they can see authenticity. Uh, and also, it's okay if they don't. And if I don't win, that's also okay. Um, but I think I would be successful with or without the coalition support. Courtney Waters, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Full Sucks. Thank you, Quentin. You're welcome.